<clears throat> so please take your seats. Apparently the streaming of the talks and video in the other room is working just perfectly. We've also are picking up a number of people that are following the talks. Who knows where in the world? Marcus is going to tell us afterwards. But apparently others have now twigged that this is being streamed. So just a heads up. Um, fun reminder on that is <clears throat> monitoring email is fine. <coughs> but try not to send video or pictures because that takes away the bandwidth. Uh, our next speaker is Brian Faulkner from Rain Coast. Um, thank you. Uh, great uh, pleasure to be able to uh, spend a couple of minutes and tell you about the organization that I work for. Um, I will preface this by saying I'm not a scientist. Uh, I just drive the boat. Um, Rain Coast is a, a nonprofit uh, conservation organization. Uh, we've been operating on the BC coast for about 30 years. Uh, we are a science-based organization. Uh, we have a, a lab at the University of Victoria. Uh, where's the remote? And uh, we set up a variety of infrastructure to do some of our own research um, in the remote areas. Most of the areas that we work are the central and north coast of British Columbia. This is our research vessel Achiever. Uh, was built and set up, or rebuilt and set up for uh, coastal research, uh, Coast Guard certified uh, sailing vessel. Uh, we are able to work for weeks at a time in uh, some of the most remote locations on the coast and. Uh, and, and keep people very comfortable. So it was part of developing our infrastructure to access these really remote areas of the coast and to actually stay in those areas and work in those areas. Beautifully laid out for working, um, got lots of room for computers for um, working and, and we sleep about, uh, well typically with gear we take about eight people. We're certified for 12 but we take about eight people uh, on board. We've done a whole variety of different um, types of work over the years. Uh, we've worked uh, very closely with Andrew a number of times uh, doing the, the sea lion census in British Columbia and up into the very bottom of southeast Alaska. Uh, we've worked in Haida Gwaii on a variety of film projects on the coast. We've done big projects with BBC, National Geographic. Uh, this one was one of three we did with NHK, the Japanese uh, uh, film company. So the vessel's really adaptable and we, we do a lot of different um, uh, types of work all up and down the coast. Um, initially, when we got the vessel, we had our own uh, marine mammal coordinator and our own marine mammal research program. Uh, we did some amazing work with uh, line transect surveys um, in the entire Hecate Basin. We did that over a period of about five years, putting on tens of thousands of miles of, uh, of track line. Um, an amazing database collected in that time period. Uh, as I mentioned, we now have a lab at the University of Victoria. It's the Hakai Rain Coast uh, Applied Conservation Lab. Uh, we have a whole fleet of uh, wonderful, amazing grad students. Uh, most of our work has, unfortunately for me, moved into the terrestrial realm. And so we do a lot of work uh, on bears and, and wolves and salmon. Um, one of the things that, that has really evolved uh, at Rain Coast is, is our collaboration and coordination with a lot of the First Nations on the coast. Um, the projects, the terrestrial projects that we work on uh, have been a, a real, uh, very, very equal collaboration with uh, First Nations on the coast. And it is a changing landscape doing research on the coast and one of the things that I'm proudest of is I think that uh, we're probably the only organization that has research protocols with five of the Central Coast and North Coast First Nations. Um, it's going to be increasingly important and it's one of the things that um, gives us a tremendous capacity to do the research on the, on the coast. As I mentioned, a lot of our work is, is the, uh, this type of marine mammal. <laughs> and unfortunately for me, they don't really need a cheever to study these animals. So um, one of the things I'm here to do is, is like John, do a shameless commercial. Uh, commercial for the for our own capacity, our own abilities to uh, to do this kind of work. Number one, on a on a simple charter basis, we've worked very uh, consistently with Andrew on the sea lion censuses. We've worked with John uh, consistently for about four years, uh, doing amazing stuff with uh, with fin whales. And um, it's it's one of the things that 
we uh, So this is what I'd really much rather be doing than a lot of the terrestrial work. So one of the things that I'm asking for people to do today is just if you have ideas, um, questions that you want to answer, questions that um, you really want the ability, the infrastructure to get out into these places. So this is a, a, a dive tag, a suction dive tag. This is one of about 300 attempts where we did not get a suction tag on a fin well. <laughs> there were a couple where we did, but um, it, it just, I wanted to just illustrate the capacity not just of the infrastructure of the vessel that we have, but also um, just Raincoast's own capacity. Within the lab, uh, we have a couple of uh, people here, uh, Eva, and uh, Aaron Recksteiner, who are very well known in the marine mammal community here, uh, doing postgraduate uh, work with us in collaboration with uh, the biological station. And uh, so there is opportunities for collaboration. There's fantastic opportunities for study. Um, we are a registered nonprofit uh, charity. And so we have uh, some abilities. We're also an insert partner, uh, slightly different now, I understand. But we do have the ability to um, uh, to, to look at, at taking on ideas and, and moving them forward right through both the lab and also through the infrastructure that we have. Possibly more important, the relationships that we have with the First Nations peoples on the coast. Thanks very much. Any questions for Brian? Not, um, oops, a question up there. Hey. <laughs> Great, thanks, Brian. Uh, next up, we have Krista talk about the, the ECHO program. Hello everybody, uh, I'm Krista Trounce and I am a project manager for the Enhancing Cetacean Habitat and Observation Program uh, through Port Metro Vancouver. I'm happy to be here to speak to you guys today. I know a lot of people in the room are already familiar with our project and are working with us, which is great. Um, but for those of you who are not aware, I just wanted to kind of give an introduction to who we are and what we're up to. So, as I stated, enhancing cetacean habitat and observation, much easier to just say echo. It's a collaboration with marine transport industry, conservation and environmental groups, First Nations, government and scientists. Um, our objective is to better understand and reduce the cumulative impacts of commercial vessel activity on at-risk whales throughout BC. So we have some nice pictures here of our, of our killer whales. <clears throat> Please excuse my voice, I've got a bit of a cold. Um, as I stated, it's a collaboration. This is a very busy slide, it's a huge screen, so you can probably actually read some of the people on here. But we, uh, we're, the way that we're structured, it's, it's led by um, Port Metro Vancouver, but it's a collaboration that involves a great number of people, both technical, non-technical, community, um, First Nations. So you get, get kind of an idea that we range from inclusion of the Chamber of Shipping, BC Coast Pilots, um, Transport Canada, EFO plays a large part in the work that we do, and a lot of technical um, consulting and scientists as well. Why has PMV initiated the ECHO program? So, um, Port Metro Vancouver is mandated under the Canada Marine Act to facilitate trade for Canada. Um, while providing a high degree of environmental protection and working with the communities in which we operate. So you can tell by this slide, um, it shows that the shaded in blue is SRKW critical habitat in Canada, and in green, SRKW critical habitat in the US. And quite obviously, the vessel transit routes um, closely overlay where the critical habitat is. So our work closely aligns with the DFO recovery strategy and action plan. 
Um, and as shipping and growth of, of BC certainly is expected to increase over the next several years, um, there's been recognition that it's already problematic for these whales. And to uh, improve the situation with expected growth, uh, we need to start working on this problem like right now. So our work plan um, has sort of three main threat categories that we're addressing, the, and that includes acoustic disturbance, underwater noise, uh, physical disturbance, vessel strike, environmental contaminants. Uh, the fourth sort of key threat that's been identified is prey availability. Um, Port Metro Vancouver is already addressing that through their habitat enhancement program. So at the ECHO program, we are advancing projects around these uh, sort of three key threat categories. And as I stated before, there are a number of people in this room uh, from DFO and from consultants and uh, a variety of other organizations who are working with us or we're helping to support their programs, um, one of which you'll hear about a bit later from John Ford. So I just wanted to kind of give you an idea of one of the projects. Uh, as I stated, we're advancing many projects. We have about 13 on the go right now under those three key threat categories. Um, and this one is one that we're very excited about and you may have read about already. Um, it got a lot of press in uh, mid-September. And it's a hydrophone listening station that was launched in the inbound um, shipping lane of the Strait of Georgia. And it is attached to, we're essentially piggybacking on Ocean Network, Can Ocean Network Canada's um, node of their Venus Observatory. And so you can see, uh, you can see where Delta Port is to kind of give you an idea. That's uh, the, and the Tawasin Ferry Terminal to kind of give you an idea of where this is. So <clears throat> you can see up in the corner there and on the next slide, we have two of these hydrophone arrays. So all the little yellow, um, all the little yellow bits are hydrophones. And we have two of these arrays uh, located such that we can help um, identify vessel source levels. That's sort of one of the key um, aspects of this particular project. These hydrophones are collecting um, ambient underwater noise. They are collecting marine mammal detections, but the key one that has a lot of interest sort of um, nationally and internationally, we've heard, is that we are going to be doing source vessel measurements. Currently, it's very challenging for a lot of ships to understand what their ships sound like underwater. And as one of the key threat categories is acoustic disturbance, we're um, seeking to find ways to understand what these ships sound like and <coughs> pardon me and help the vessels make themselves quieter so um, jasco applied sciences ocean networks canada and transport canada are our partners on this project and over the next this was launched on um, september 14th and over the next year we're going to be collecting all of this data and we should be able to help identify through this large collection of data which correlates um, AIS, so it, it, we can identify which ship sounds like what and we'll hopefully be able to say, okay, you know what, container ships, the majority of container ships have this particular sound signature and how, well, the next step will be how is that affecting the whales. Um, or if you have a certain fleet, like you could say to one of the large shipping companies like Maersk, you have, you know, eight ships calling to Port Metro Vancouver, and seven of them are really quiet, and one has this really strange singing of your propeller. So we're hoping to be able to use this data set to help make vessels more quiet. So that's just an example of one of the projects that we're undertaking. There's, there's a bunch more, but I just kind of wanted to highlight for you the kind of work that we are doing. So our focus, our research focus, is on the impact of shipping on at-risk whales. So um, acoustic, physical, and contaminants. Um, our end goal is to develop mitigation measures. So we're a couple of years away, but we're, we, we recognize now, that, and everybody recognizes now, that the at-risk whales in our region um, 
it overlaps with shipping and there's something has to has to start happening we have to start having these conversations and trying to move forward into making the conditions better in particular for the southern resident killer whales who um, their their uh, critical habitat is you know o overlaps with uh, with Port Metro Vancouver's um, jurisdiction so PMB can can only uh, advance um, certain um, we get we can propose mitigation measures we're not a regulator so our intention is to bring together science through collaboration and figure out what can we do to help make things better and so these mitigation measures may include voluntary slowdowns they may include could we keep people to one side of the shipping lane uh, or, or can we help you? Can we help make things? I know, I know. Or, or what can we do with the vessels to help make them more quieter? So that's our end goal: is to come up with these mitigation measures. And if you have uh, any, want any further information, search the oh. e PMV, <laughs> search the PMV website. Okay. Or there's my email. <laughs> Thank you very much. There's always time for a question as we set up the next talk. Does anybody have any questions? <laughs> so I don't get chicken? So the, the seed funding for the yeah, ECHO program. The question. Oh. Repeat the question. oh, sorry. The question was where does the funding come from for the ECHO program? The seed funding has come from Port Metro Vancouver. We've received funding from Transport Canada. And we're looking for and currently receiving funding from uh, Trans Mountain as well. And we're seeking funding from anybody and everybody who wants to help contribute. But we, we anticipate as PMB that uh, we'll be able to, to work towards getting more in industry funding to the program since it's kind of their impact. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks. Next up we have Tessa Danilesco, Lightning Network. Thank you, Andrew, and uh, hello to everyone. Uh, so my name is Tessa Danilesco, and I'm with the Marine Mammal Research Program at the Vancouver Aquarium's Coastal Ocean Research Institute. Uh, but today I'm going to be talking about the program that I coordinate. It's called the BC Cetacean Sightings Network. I'm sure many of you are familiar with it. Uh, focusing on our new app and some of the future uh, projects that we're going to be undertaking as well. Uh, so Whale Report has been a huge success story for us this year. Uh, has anyone here downloaded Whale Report? Reported with Whale Report? Oh, that means a lot. That's awesome. Uh, it's been incredibly successful in its first five months. So this is our smartphone app, uh, available for Android and Apple smartphones. Uh, to date, uh, in its first five months, we've had over 1,800 downloads, over 1,700 new sightings. And uh, this has resulted in an almost three-fold increase in the number of sightings received over the same time period of last year. Uh, so the sightings network really is exploding in a good way, uh, and I'd love to see this continue. What does this mean, though? Uh, one of the really important implications is that we're seeing a lot more sightings come in in real time. So novel species or uh, common species in interesting locations, we're getting those sightings right away, which means that if we need to head out on the water and investigate further, uh, we're, more, we're more able to do that. Uh, also, we're able to receive reports of distressed animals a lot sooner, uh, and so this is, is really positive, and I know Paul Cottrell is pretty stoked on that uh, as well. Uh, uh, I'd love to provide an update on the North Coast Cetacean Research Initiative as well. Many of you know uh, the lovely Caitlin Birdsall. She's been up in Prince Rupert um, uh, coordinating this research effort uh, out of our satellite office there. Uh, so her presence up north uh, has um, resulted in a number of sightings uh, in that area. Uh, and basically that represents a, an increase of about 75% pre-app. Uh, in the north over that time period. So she's done a lot of important work up there. And here are some of the key findings that the information that she's been able to gather uh, uh, that's, uh, that's come around. So uh, the information that she's gathered has revealed Pacific white-sided dolphins are rare in the inside waters of Chatham Sound. Uh, humpback whales are the most abundant cetacean on the north coast. Uh, and as well as a summer aggregation for this migratory species, we're also seeing a winter aggregation uh, in southern Chatham Sound. Uh, northern resident killer whales have been recorded uh, on a remote rubbing beach off Porcher Island. 
And harbor porpoises are very abundant in Prince Rupert Harbor and approaches. Uh, large aggregations have been observed, and mating has even been recorded uh, occurring in these large aggregations. So Caitlin's going to be looking uh, into those, uh, those harbor porpoise aggregations further uh, using some uh, acoustic detection devices uh, coming up in the next year. One of the other projects that we've undertaken uh, is to uh, use a GIS model that estimates or quantifies observer effort for our opportunistically collected sightings. Uh, what we've been able to do with that GIS model is create a sightings density per unit effort index uh, for, um, uh, for species that we collect sightings on. So uh, taking that one step further, we're able to map that sightings density per unit effort of, uh, index uh, for harbor porpoises, which you can see here. And we've overlain a layer of fishing vessel traffic. So what this identifies is area of high risk for entanglement for harbor porpoises. And you can see these two seasonal maps uh, up here. Oh, I really like this story because it kind of tells the full circle of what our program can do. So we collect this data from coastal citizens and mariners. We can then analyze it and map it. Uh, what we're now focusing on doing is actually conducting outreach specifically for mariners who operate in these areas of high risk. And hopefully what that will lead to is direct action in mitigating this threat. We're also uh, starting a project uh, called the Mariner's Guide to the Whales of Canada's West Coast. This is in collaboration with Port of Metro Vancouver and the Port Authority of Prince Rupert. Uh, and it's a guidance document. It's going to contain a lot of information on cetaceans off our coast, but a lot of maps as well, uh, focusing on uh, the threats that are posed to cetaceans by large vessel traffic. Uh, the second phase of this project uh, is actually going to introduce an alert system for mariners. So, uh, marine pilots and ship captains, and they're going to be able to receive alerts of cetacean sightings that are occurring nearby to them. Uh, and this is with the aim of hopefully uh, being able to minimize encounters that are occurring between large vessels and cetaceans. And so those are some of the exciting new directions that we're going to be taking in the next year or so. Um, this is my contact information. Uh, please continue to report your sightings. Uh, if you haven't reported before, please do. Uh, I'd love to uh, let you know how that can happen. It's really easy, I promise. Uh, and thank you to, to everyone who's been such an amazing uh, support network for, for the Sightings Network. I uh, would love to continue to see it grow uh, over the next couple of years. And if you haven't don downloaded the app, please do. Uh, and with that, I'd love to invite any questions. Thanks. Teresa, any questions? No? Okay. The next. Oh, I got your sheet. <laughs> okay, we'll load up uh, uh, Lisa's talk. This. Hi, everyone. Um, it's been a couple years since I've had the pleasure of attending and giving a talk, um, so I'm very happy to be here. Um, <laughs> off the side of my desk, for the most part, I've been trying to pull together a bunch of data um, to present on, or to write a couple papers on vessel strikes and entanglement risk and various things that were the focus of my job for many years, and I can happy, happily say that the vessel strike paper is under review. Um, so we're very close, not peer reviewed just yet, but Anyway, so I'm here to present some of the preliminary data um, to you on what we've managed to pull together from eight years of, um, of incident reporting, uh, specifically on vessel strikes. So I only put four slides up in hopes that I can actually attain my five, my five <laughs> minutes and not run over. So I've jam-packed everything onto four slides. Um, so. Uh, when we pull out the vessel strike data over eight years, 2004 to 2011, uh, there were 76 reports, but, uh, and those covered 10 species, but um, only 32 of those were confirmed to have been vessel strikes. So we were very rigorous in how we were classifying vessel strike and confirming it. And I'll get into a bit of the reasoning for that later. Um, so 30% of those were of carcasses that were determined that their cause of death, death was a vessel strike. Um, and animals that were alive, sorry, that should say injured, not inured, 
um, <laughs> injured animals that were alive, and there was evidence that the injury was fairly fresh and therefore occurred in BC waters. So we eliminated animals that um, may have had a vessel strike occur a year ago, three months ago, because it's very likely that they may not have been in BC waters at the time, and we can't classify that as a BC strike. Um, and we didn't want to double count with other researchers, research happening elsewhere. And then 68% of the data were of witnessed strikes. So these are strikes where people actually were certain that they hit a whale, and there was evidence to support that. The strike locations vary all over the coast, as you can see from that chart. Um, the triangles are the witness strikes, and the dots are the not witness, so for the carcasses or the uh, scarred up animals. 37% of those are off the west coast of Vancouver Island, and that also corresponds to 41% of them of the witness strikes being off west coast Vancouver Island. All except for one carcass or injured live animal was seen around Vancouver Island. And of course, when we look at the data, the only ones we can really say occurred off west coast Vancouver Island or in any one location are the ones where it was witnessed because a carcass can float and a live animal can swim a great distance before it's seen. So although there may be a dot on a map that do doesn't necessarily mean for the dots, not the triangles, <laughs> that that incident, that vessel strike occurred at that location. So we have to keep, bear that in mind. Um, of the data set, there were seven fatalities, and this is for all marine mammals, let me um, reiterate, not just for whales. And 31% of the data set included animals that had severe or life-threatening injuries, seven of those being fatalities. And you can see at the graph at the top the range over the, the eight years of the data set. What does this mean about vessel details? So we looked very carefully at the information that was provided. Now again, the sample size goes down to 22 here, so not that big of a sample size, but we're hoping to continue that in the future and, and start to glean a little bit more from this data. Um, the vessel types and sizes, 86% of those were from vessels that were fairly small in size, so less than 15 meters long. Half of the witnessed reports were from commercial recreational motorized vessels, so that means um, whale watching vessels, that means charter fishing vessels, um, the other category I was thinking of, oh, and other ecotourism vessels, and sailboats, which are in that category. And you can see from the chart where that plays out in terms of the different types of vessels that were report that were involved in the reports, as well as the activity. Um, in the legend there, that they were undertaking at the time of the strike. Um, so transiting was 73, represents 73 percent of the data. So that's vessels transiting from one location to another. So even though it may be a whale watching boat that's, um, that may have been involved in a strike or a, a charter boat, they're not striking the animal while they're watching it. They're striking it on the way to or from their, act, their actually destined activity. Um, the range and speeds were very broad, everything from four, five knots up to 43 knots. Um, where we could, we, we tried to get an average or the descriptive terms, at least, you know, um, at full speed. Uh, we'd, we'd look at the details of that particular vessel and try to uh, figure out what at full speed really means for their size of engine and, and size of vessel and so on. Um, so the average that caused any kind of injury was 18 knots, and that's very consistent with um, other literature around the world. Um, the, there were several slow speed collisions, as you can see, the five to nine knot range at the bottom chart there. Those were mainly from sailing vessels that struck animals, um, or vessels that had an encounter with a whale that was be, um, exhibiting friendly behavior. So animals that are hanging around the props, swimming around the boat, um, and just happened to get struck. And there were, as you can see, a couple of research or government vessel strikes in there. And so by strike, I don't necessarily mean a very high-powered traumatic strike. It may very well be a nick from a propeller, but it's still an animal having an interaction with a vessel. All right, so what are the impacts to whales? I'm going to whittle this down from all marine mammals to whales now. Um, although I recognize this is a very small sample size over only an eight-year period, but let's throw in a rate of mortality or, or injury of strike just for the sake of it. With the, what this data set re represents is that 1.35 humpbacks per year are being impacted by strikes. Half of a killer whale 
<laughs> odd numbers, but that's what's pulling out. In future, uh, hopefully, well, hopefully we won't get more of a sample size. We will have reduced strikes. Um, the type of injury that's occurring, there's blunt force versus sharp trauma. So blunt force trauma is an impact of a hull on an animal that doesn't necessarily cause a laceration, but may cause considerable contusions or damage internally. Uh, sharp trauma being um, propeller wounds and so on. So when we look at the data set over different species, humpback whales are just slightly more struck or more impacted by blunt force trauma over sharp and killer whales in the reverse direction. The location of um, highest injury um, on the body of an animal um, is the dorsal mid-back area, 41% there. And that's mainly to humpback whales. And kind of makes sense. That's the area of the body that's going to be at the surface of the water for the longest period of time. Or the first portion of the body that's going to be seen at the surface and going to be struck versus a tail that's, you know, the back's already going to be up. So the vessel will have time to see the back before it strikes and hopefully avoid. So that makes some sense. Um, half of the strikes were minor in severity. 73% of humpback whale injuries were minor. Um, <clears throat> now, there's some reasons why different injury types um, and different injury locations, <clears throat> why that may differ for different species. And if you think of their behavior in the water, how acrobatic they are, how fast they are to dive, um, what kind of foraging behaviors they have, how distracted they are by what they're doing, so they may not even notice an oncoming vessel. Those types of things explain a lot of this, of this data. Press the wrong button. Okay. So, I'm close. All right, last slide. Uh, what, what I'm trying to say here is, although we have a small sample size, or there, was a, there was a fair number of strikes that were reported, not everything is known. Um, we had to eliminate a lot of the strike data because we don't have enough information. We need to investigate further. Um, a lot of stuff isn't reported. A lot of strikes, they don't even, vessel operators may not have even known they occurred. There is an overrepresentation, one would assume, of large boats or small boat strikes in here because small boats are going to feel the impact. A large boat may not. Therefore, small boat um, strikes are more likely to be reported. Small boats are going to cause more minor injuries than large vessels are, and so that animal may very well live to show its battle scars and be seen. So there, we have to take that with a grain of salt as well. Um, sometimes struck animals aren't recited after the fact, so there's lack of confirmation of injuries that have occurred. Um, animals that are struck in offshore waters may very well sink before they drift to shore, so we don't have them for necropsy purposes. And if an animal is not necropsied, we can't say for certain whether it was struck by a boat or not. A lot of injuries are internal, and they are not seen unless we cut it open and we do a thorough investigation. Um, back of the envelope calculation here, of all the necropsied animals that were struck, um, or 23% of all necropsied um, whales were struck from this data set. And if you calculate that over all stranded whales that we've seen in our data set or of all the incidents, that means that maybe about another nine and a half of those whales may have been struck. That we could add to the data set if we were to do a bit of modeling work there. I think I need more bigger sample size to get there. So that is why we're moving on with additional, um, additional efforts to investigate the risk of vessel strike. And that's the topic of Linda's talk that's up next. We'll do on one quick question for Lisa. Can you repeat the question? Uh, the question was, were there any commercial vessels that were reported to have struck? Commercial fishing vessels. There was one in the data set. It was actually an interesting case <laughs> because there was a, the, ves the vessel had reported striking a whale but hadn't seen it resurface. And a whale was found stranded on the shore within a few days of that. And looking at drift models and so on, um, and knowing the description of the whale that was struck from the vessel, um, there's a very good chance that the animal on shore was the struck animal. Um, so I did. There was a lot of investigation that went into this data set to try and tease out anything that you know, so we're not double counting things. Uh, Linda is going to uh, continue the discussion of the unfortunate physical results. Laws of physics between cetaceans and boats.
Uh, okay, not exactly, actually. I'm going to stick away from all the, what actually, this is more about what's the, what's the chance that these, could, these events could happen. Okay, sorry, I wasn't paying attention to the, uh, okay, so to make my slides go forward, I'm going to push back in that place. Okay. Okay, so, um, so yes, the title here is Large, whale, Large Baleen Whale Ship Strike Risk on the West Coast of Vancouver Island. So instead of thinking about, okay, let's make this go. Okay, so ship traffic poses collision risk to whales. It really does. Um, uh, you've already seen that it's difficult to actually enumerate the number of animals that are being struck. So another approach might be to, to look at the, um, the, the risk or the probability that these events might occur. And another title I might have given to this talk would have been something like uh, Whale Habitat uh, Bisected by Marine Highways or Roadkill on the Open Sea. So the issue for us at DFO is a lot to do with species that are listed as threatened or endangered. So these species, blue whales, fin whales, humpbacks, and the right whale that was on the very first uh, picture that I showed, occur off places like the west coast of Vancouver Island, which happens to be bisected by one of these marine highways. And so we're concerned about what's the chance of these animals being struck by, by ships. One of the reasons that big ships like this are a cause of concern are for a number of reasons. One is the routes overlap whale habitat. The other is the speed of ships. The other is the size of ships. And the final one is to do with the draft of the ships, the fact that these ships actually go under the water and that there's an even greater distance under the water that the effect of being struck by a whale um, can occur as a result of hydro hydrodynamic forces um, around the moving ship. Okay, so the shipping routes overlap whale habitat. This is a slide. Um, the bottom here, I'm showing you some of this traffic data for the west coast of Vancouver Island. It says AIS, that means automated information system. It's the, it's, the, it's the reporting of ship traffic information. And this is the source of the data that we used. And what you're seeing here are some circles. And this is basically the study area that we were interested in. And you can see some very bright colors. And that shows you the routes and the intensity of shipping that's coming in and out of Juan de Fuca Strait. The ships are going to places like Port Metro Vancouver, Tacoma, Seattle. So these are all really big ports, and there's a lot of traffic. And it happens to overlap with whale habitat. Now, speed is an issue. It turns out that the lethality of a ship strike increases with speed, and it's not a linear relationship. It's actually exponential. So when you get to speeds over 10 knots, the lethality increases quite a lot. So what we did first was our question, of course, was, well, where are the whales? We know there's a highway. We know that historically there were whales out there on the West Coast, but we didn't have a lot of data. So our first thing to do was to get some information on the distribution of, of these large whales on the West Coast. And we did that with aerial surveys. And we worked with Transport Canada, who have a surveillance plane that they uh, do pollution surveillance flights out there. We did 34 surveys. And that was our huge study area. We could never do that in a matter of 34 single-day surveys by ship. So this was truly accomplished because we were in the air. And this is our data. These are the results of all those surveys. And I'm only showing you three species here, and I'm only going to end up talking about two of them. So these are the baleen whales. They're, we had uh, five sightings of blue whales, so it turned out not to be enough for the modeling approach we used, but they're there. And we, and we have fin whales, which are all the red dots, and humpback whales. And you can see instantly that there's a bit of habitat um, separation between those two, humpbacks on the shelf, fin whales off the shelf. <coughs> so, and here's the traffic data. So what we, and that's over our study area. So the pattern here, I just want you to note these colors. The pattern on the first tells you about the distribution of the traffic um, reported as relative probability of encountering a vessel in any part of the study area. And where it's red, that's the highest density. And then as it, um, as it diffuses out, as the ships spread, as they head offshore, it becomes a paler uh, green, yellow. And then the, and the blue is where there's quite low densities of shipping. The bottom figure shows the so this is, the, this is the part of the data set we were most interested in. We were interested in that, that part of that traffic population that's large ships traveling offshore from ports 
that are traveling at speeds of over 12 knots, and it turns out most of that traffic is, is traveling at speeds over 12 knots. Okay, so what we were interested in doing, what I want you just to notice is the graph on the left-hand side at the top with the colored dots. So that's the same figure I showed you before. So the, the, the green, yellow are all those humpback whale sightings. So what we needed to do first was we need to create sort of a, a think of it as a surface a probability surface of where these whales are. So these whales are like our samples, and we want to actually have a predictive surface of where those humpback whales are in our study area. So we did something called a GAM, which is a generalized additive model, and we used some predictors of latitude and depth, and we came out with this relative probability of encountering a humpback whale. And what you can see from this, the take-home message, the humpback whale highest probability of encountering a humpback whale is on the shelf, right about the 200 uh, meter depth contour. And then it becomes a little more diffuse on the shelf and that they're basically not off the shelf. And then we did the same thing with our fin whale data. And in this case, the fin whales are the, are the blue, are the pink. And you can see they're quite, the sightings are fairly diffuse over what we call this sort of abyssal plane once you get off the shelf. That's where most of them were. And when we model that to get a smooth surface, we show that the relative probability of encountering a fin wheel gets higher as you move away from that shelf and off the slope. The slope area would be that where it's yellow. Relative probability is yellow, and then it gets higher as you head further off. So that was, that was sort of our distribution models of fin whales. So OK, this is, that's our data set for the fin whales and, and, the, and the humpback whales. And now we're interested in saying, well, let's put those two together. Let's put humpbacks and ships together. So again, on the, on the left-hand side where it says A, uh, that's again that model to showing you where those humpback whales are. Immediately to the right of that where it says C, it shouldn't say C, but it does, um, is where the probability of a ship and a humpback whale being in the same space. And the same space is actually quite a large cell. It's, it's a five by five grid cell. So what that shows you is that that where, uh, where a ship and a humpback whale are most likely to encounter each other is, is in the Strait of Juan de Fuca and as you're coming out of that Strait of Juan de Fuca and just near the shelf break. And then the bottom one says, so where it says E, this is where, okay, given those areas where you have a relative probability, high relative probability of a ship and a whale, let's take into consideration the speed of ships. So remember, speeds of ships over, traveling over 10 to 12 knots have an exponentially higher uh, risk of, of a, a causing a lethal strike. And so when you put that onto that as well in, the, in our modeling exercise here, you see again that the highest risk of a lethal strike is in the Strait of Juan de Fuca at the sort of the entrance as it begins to fan out and right at the shelf break. So we, then we did the same thing with fin whales. Oh, I went the wrong way, whoops. So here's our fin whales again. So on the left is is actually just showing you the relative probability of encountering a fin whale all by itself swimming around out there. And on, immediately to the right is the probability of you encountering a ship and a whale in the same grid cell, one of these big ships coming out of the ports. And where you can see again is we end up with the Strait of Juan de Fuca is quite a, a high probability. But the area that's particularly interesting is when you get off the shelf and you see this line heading westward off the shelf. And so, and then again, we add that, we say, okay, within that area, with, given, given that ships and whales are encountering each other, we add on that lethality component. And again, we see that the highest likelihood where whales are going to be struck, I'm almost there, don't you dare. <laughs> <laughs> so the highest strike of, of being struck is also in that area. So, and that's it. So that was my, actually, I'm going to go back. So, so I just want to say this is a huge effort. This is just the people who are helped in this aerial survey. There's more people who helped with analysis. And I also want to acknowledge all the funding support. And the most important part was our enthusiastic, dedicated team, unlimited. We couldn't have done this without this huge team of people. Thanks. I'm I'm not here to intimidate you. You are. No, I'm not. Okay. I'm not. Ask my students. I'm not intimidating in the least. <laughs> um, do we have a quick question for Linda while we're uh, getting set up? Yes. Yes. The 
the question is, uh, do I think that cruise ships, which are the ones we've, we've had a number of incidents which, where whales are actually showing up on the bow of a cruise ship in Vancouver Harbor, and we hence know, oh, it really was struck. Um, and the question is, do you think those are being picked up in the Strait of Juan de Fuca or somewhere else? And I yeah, because they aren't going. So in fact, in those cases, actually, that this is a, we've focused our study off the west coast of Vancouver Island. But another area that's probably going to emerge as fairly important is the routes those cruise ships are taking, which is actually coming down through Hecate Strait and Queen Charlotte Sound. And so that's um, the whole point of this was to demonstrate a way of doing this, finding the, uh, showing that we can bring this data together in sort of a, a, a probability uh, of risk type of an analysis, which is an alternative approach to actually enumerating the number of mortalities. Next person, sorry. Okay, so the next talk is uh, not a new program. We, we kept it on the hush-hush. Uh, <laughs> we didn't want the crowds breaking down the door. Um, so uh, Sue is actually going to be talking uh, about some work that, um, well, I guess you'll talk about Eileen Jeffries is leading this on uh, Harbor Porpoise Harbor Project. Harbor Porpoise Project, it's hard to say. <laughs> yes, originally Eileen Jeffries, who's the principal investigator for this project, was going to come. She couldn't at the last minute. So she asked me to come and give a short presentation. Um, I was the field assistant for several years, a little while back. Anyway, the Harbor Porpoise Project, it's sponsored by the Pacific Biodiversity Institute, which is based in Washington State. Um, most of our long-term data has actually been acquired uh, down the road in Anacortes. There's a channel between Anacortes and Burroughs Island. I hope I'm pushing the right but yes, um, Pacific Biodiversity Institute is dedicated to using the best available science to enhance natural resource planning and management decisions. We're focused on the conservation of biodiversity and maintenance of ecological, ecological integrity. The project goals for the Harbor Porpoise Project have been to demonstrate the use of acoustic monitors in relationship to finding the presence of the uh, harbor porpoise. We wanted to compare acoustic recordings to land-based observation, determine habitat use and needs of the harbor porpoise, help to establish protected areas, hopefully, and to look at population trends increasing or decreasing. Our acoustic monitor locations have been spread out a bit in the Salish Sea. Our most long-term one, as I mentioned, was in, Burrow, in Burroughs Pass is in Burroughs Pass. This is 2014. It's, it's still there. Um, we deployed another monitor uh, off of Cypress Island in Rosario Strait. There's one Port Townsend, Admiralty Inlet, Hood Canal near Haynesville, and up in Saturna Island in BC. The data I will be talking about uh, now is uh, the data we've had from Burroughs Pass. It's our long-term Okay. We've been looking at the harbor porpoise presence from two completely independent metrics, which makes it really kind of interesting. That, but these both metrics are giving similar patterns. Metrics are looking at data from acoustic monitors and from land-based observations. Each is really a robust metric, and each has actually confirmed each other. Kind of neat. Um, this representation of our seasonal presence in Burroughs Pass, land-based observations, 2011-2013, um, looking at fraction of time present, averaged by month, you know, January, December. It's kind of interesting. Now, this, these are the acoustical recording data, seasonal presence in Burroughs Pass. And kind of think back to the last slide, there's some good similarities there. Oops, what's happening? Oops. There, okay. Um, the harbor porpoise presence for the two metrics with acoustic, acoustic monitoring is measured by the duration of click trains that the porpoise produce each minute. You know, the, the monitor is merged 24-7, uh, usually for about two to three months. Of course, it has to be serviced, batteries change. 
out and refresh, but it's recording data 24 7. And then we have our land base observations where there is a count of a number of porpoise present in a sequence of 10 minute intervals, usually over a two hour period. And that involves an observer sitting up on the cliff looking at uh, a visual grid system and recording presence. Well, what we're finding that's really kind of interesting is the slope from each of these metrics of porpoise presence is actually negative. And uh, this has been true for the months in which data has been collected from 2012 to 2015. And it's true for both independent metrics, so we're feeling pretty confident about it. It does appear that the presence of porpoise in Burroughs uh, Pass is decreasing. Now this is looking at a wider scale. Um, 2012, 2015, trend of porpoise presence at Burroughs Pass with the acoustic monitoring. Um, it's a yearly trend by month, and it's not just a yearly trend, like you have a bunch part of the year, not the other. Each month has shown a decline, so we're seeing an overall negative trend. Land-based observations, different metric, seeing basically the same, the same trend. So just for summary and conclusion. The presence of the harbor porpoise is decreasing at Burroughs Pass. The metrics are able to show a trend over a period of four years. Since the harbor porpoise is a sentinel species of the Salish Sea, and Burroughs Pass has really traditionally been a, a stronghold for the harbor porpoise, and the declining of its presence may be a reason for concern. And we're going to continue to be concerned, monitor, and hopefully have more information down the road. Thank you. I could entertain some questions, but okay. Aileen's our pro, and I could give you her contact information. Okay, if anyone has a question that pursue. Lots of theories. That's the fun part, <laughs> you know. Oh, the, the question was, do we have any theories of why the uh, corpus population or presence is decreasing? I'm just, I, at this point, I would, you know, lots of theories that we could all brainstorm on. Um, <laughs> that's for the future for us to all look at. Okay, now we're going to have uh, Lauren come up and tell us uh, some more of, uh, on the theme of the trouble with boats. <laughs> so I, as you can probably tell from my accent, I'm not from here. Um, I just arrived at the end of the summer where I met Andrew, who basically kind of said, oh, come and do a small talk at this very, very low key. Not many people are going to be there. <laughs> so when I arrived this morning, I was kind of a little bit surprised. <laughs> um, so I am working out at UVic as a postdoc and I'm part of a bigger project um, that's MEOPAR sponsored to do with marine noise and EIS data uh, from shipping traffic. Is it? So I am going to, my, well my aim today is basically to kind of touch base with a lot of people here um, as I'm going to be kind of starting to coordinate the marine mammal side of the project. Um, and yeah, so that is... Andrew's <laughs> bingo from me coming here today. Um, so the NAMES project, um, actually I'll go back because there's a reason behind my talk and the way that the talk's laid out. I spoke to a colleague in my office and said I've got to be do this five minute talk, how on earth do you do your talk in five minutes? And he likened it to speed dating for scientists. So, <laughs> so I googled it and these are the top five questions apparently you should ask when speed dating. So one is what are your passions in life? So obviously marine science and actually being in BC is a bit of a dream for me. So I have families across here and I've always wanted to work across here. So what do you do for fun? Well, <laughs> not much other than my work. <laughs> um, so this is um, some, actually this is one of the graphs, taken, the maps taken from the memes project. Um, I, I am, my background is in marine spatial planning and management. And the project that we are looking at is very much to do with noise and impacts, or its wider impacts, and how we can kind of 
kind of translate these um, and engage stakeholders um, more with the whole process. So, my work this year is going to be lovely locations. Um, we have a study site up in Saks, Saks Harbour, way up north. <laughs> um, and we're going to be doing a stakeholder meeting up there and trying to engage with local communities about the shipping noise. At the moment, there isn't that much, but it's forecast that with the Arctic opening up, that that will increase. Um, we're also going to be, our other, one of the other study sites is on the Bowie Seamount. Um, we're having a workshop at Howe de Gwaii as well, and also the Salish Sea. And I'm going to come across a lot of these <laughs> when I'm at these various things. Um, sorry. This is a really weird question, apparently, you should ask. Is the glass half full or half empty? I, from, as I said, I've only been here a few months and working on the project, but to me, there seems to be far more positives than there are negatives. Um, I think the fact that DC is very proactive at the moment in terms of introducing noise management into its policy is a really good thing. It's something that's not really come up back home um, in the UK that much because shipping isn't such a big issue. Um, and definitely within Europe, um, the Marine Strategy Framework Directive, they have... It's, out, it's, it's more directed towards renewable energy developments because that's a big concern in terms of noise over here, over back home, sorry, I should say. Um, and also, as, I should, as part of the Meopar project, we managed to just get some funding and we're looking to do some collaborative work back home in Scotland as well. Um, so it's linking up and doing lessons learned from different approaches. So I think it's all rather positive rather than negative. I like to play anyway. This is the last question. <laughs> Thank Google for this one. <laughs> so yeah, basically I'm keen to speak to everybody and, and learn what you all have to say. And yeah, please feel free to approach me and, and chat. <laughs> That's me. Thank you for <laughs>
both uh, seasons of the study. You can see in the red, red uh, circle, uh, some whales uh, get essentially uh, leave the herd and become entrapped or isolated for up to four hours at a time in river canals. And these groups, um, when the, the tide is low, the, essentially the, the sandbars around the canals act as a sound barrier. So there's no doubt that you're recording that particular group, which is a great uh, thing, because then you have uniform variables across all the, the isolation events. You've got the same hydrophone depth every time, same distance to the whales, same situation, and same uh, behavior. Um, and there's two other things that made uh, these isolation events really valuable. One of them is that when the whales are entrapped, they pretty much um, produce uh, contact calls. A lot of the time, 70% of their calls um, are, are contact calls. And so this facilitates the study of contact call rate in relation to group composition and contact call uh, parameters. Um, an example. It's very, um, I wish you could hear better. No? Okay. So you can get an idea, basically. It's a really, really uh, neat recording. I wish it was a little louder. Um, but yes, the whales produce contact calls when they are in these situations. This was uh, filmed with a GoPro at the top of a very, very long pole. The, the other um, great thing about these isolation events um, was that we could estimate uh, group composition very accurately because uh, I was able to borrow footage from a documentary uh, film crew um, that, that um, recorded, filmed essentially um, all but two of these events. So those two, I got group composition with the, the rig and the, the GoPro on top of the pole, and the rest of them, uh, I was able to count the whales, which when you have a group of 38 whales and you want to know how many neonates, how many yearlings, how many juveniles and how many adults you got, to do it at eye level is very difficult. To do it from the air is very easy. Um, so I had 14 isolation events, roughly half of them, six to be exact, had neonates in them. This is just very preliminary data, but what is exciting about this is that um, those um, group isolation events that had neonates in them are the ones that have these very low frequency contact calls uh, where most of the frequency, um, the peak frequency essentially is below 10 kilohertz. Again, uh, you know, not, not very loud recordings, but uh, calves do sound, or groups with calves, you encounter these, these calls that are very different than, than those that you encounter in groups that only have adults in them. And this is important because these uh, calf calls can potentially uh, get more easily masked by anthropogenic noise, especially vessel noise. This, by the way, this finding really confirms uh, findings from previous studies at the aquarium that calves produce these kind of lower frequency uh, calls. And so taking this knowledge to the St. Lawrence where the population is endangered and there's an unexplained calf mortality in recent years, and one of the, uh, the prevalent hypotheses is that this calf mortality uh, increase has to do with an increase in premature separation. So the question is, is mother calf acoustic contact being compromised by underwater noise? Are, are vessels masking the very low frequency, harder to hear calls of uh, calves? So I spent uh, two weeks in uh, 2015, uh, this, this year essentially, establishing viable sampling protocols to uh, develop a study to test this idea. Um, and so figuring out how to target group with groups with calves along the river, how to record contact calls in very, under various uh, levels of noise, and how to estimate um, group composition accurately uh, with a drone and, and keep track of mother calf uh, distances. And this will hopefully take place uh, next year. So lots of people to thank, um, and I'd be happy to answer any questions. Do we have a question or two for Valeria? Okay, thank you very much. Um, our next speaker is uh, Lance Barrett Leonard, who I don't believe is talking about noise. Making noise. Making noise, <laughs> as he says. Which is the button here? Just uh, Okay, thanks. Thanks very much, everybody. Um, last year, I uh, presented at this, uh, at this event uh, the, some preliminary results of the photogrammetry study that I've been doing on killer whales with, uh, with my two colleagues, John Durbin 
and Holly Fernback uh, pictured here. I showed lots of uh, photos last time. I'm going to show fewer photos this time and um, uh, talk a little bit more about why we're doing the study. But I will start with a bit of a bit of background. Um, the, uh, the, the motivation for this work that really involves measuring killer whales from the air and looking at their body condition, their, their, their fatness, if you like, their length to width ratios, was motivated to a large extent by this paper that John Ford uh, and colleagues published in 2009. And they showed that uh, this very, very striking correlation in years, in, in particularly in a period of several years of very low Chinook abundance, mortality of both northern and southern resident killer whales spiked. Um, this effect uh, was very clear in the, uh, in the late 90s uh, up to the er very early 2000s. And uh, there was a, a weaker uh, evidence that had happened uh, previous to this, too, in the, uh, in the early 1980s during a similar period. So that, um, that finding really led to a very uh, comprehensive set of workshops, four workshops, one organized by DFO and, and three by uh, NOAA. Um, both, both governments participated in all four of them. Um, and uh, some of the people in this room were, were present at uh, all or most of those workshops, I think. Um, and, and the purpose really was to, to study the, the, or discuss the, the effects of salmon fisheries on southern resident killer whales. That's, southern residents are, the, uh, are, the, are critically endangered. And, uh, the, so, and it was primarily a modeling exercise, so we, we got to see lots of graphs and figures and more Bayesian stuff that you could shake a stick at. Um, to try to, 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 to model different scenarios and ask what would happen if we reduced fishing here or there or, uh, or took other management actions. Um, and it was a very challenging exercise. And, and the final report that came out in 2012 was, uh, it's, a very, it's a very comprehensive report, but I think we were all disappointed, not by the report, but, but by the fact that, it, that this whole exercise had, had not really succeeded in identifying any, um, any management direct recommendations that we could that could be translated into management actions. It's just a really tough job. Um, and the reason it's tough is because the um, catastrophic mortality for these populations is only a few animals, uh, an increase of a few animals a year, maybe you know, five or six for northern residents, two or three for southern residents. Um, and that's just, those just aren't big numbers to look at. So if you're looking at from year to year to year and saying, gee, we had five animals die this year, we had two animals die this year, what's different? You're not going to be able to. And some of those deaths are going to be random. You're not going to be able to tease out the, um, which salmon run is the most important, for example. It's a, power, it's a statistical power problem. Um, and really, the logic of the workshop, and it made sense, was to, uh, to determine which salmon runs, or the hope was, uh, are most important to, to the whales so that management could be, be um, targeted and looking at this, uh, this mortality in more detail. But as I say, this is, the problem is there's there's just not enough data to work with. We'd have to have incredibly long time series was the take home message to really make sense of that. The way forward, whale condition, I think, um, and my colleagues uh, certainly think, whale condition is linked to foraging success. Um, we know that animals get fatter when they eat a lot. Um, by measuring when and where whales lose and gain weight, we can learn, uh, we can assess the relative run of salmon strengths and salmon, the importance of salmon runs. I was up late last night. Um, <laughs> And some of you were there with me. And, um, <laughs> and anyway, this, uh, this information, this condition information, can be used for long-term and short-term and emergency fisheries measures, perhaps, if it's successful. And the, the panel, the scientific panel that, uh, that uh, wrote the workshop report um, endorsed this use, use of photogrammetry and this focus on body condition to try and move this study forward. It's, it's very, very simple conceptually. You photograph a whale from above, Hard to do this from boat from for various reasons. It's great to have this planned view of the whale. You can measure its length to width ratio in a very straightforward way. You can measure its absolute length too, because we know the height of the drone and the uh, height of the camera and the um, focal length. And we can also and do slice the whale into into pieces and look at its shape. You know, at 10% at increments down its body. So we can we can uh, tell pregnancy as well from about five months on, um, based on these on these photos. So it's a it's a powerful. Uh, a very simple tool, really, but, but, a, but a powerful one, a useful one. There's a concern, of course, that you know, whales can be fat or thin for reasons other than starvation. Um, there could be individual variation. It could be disease. Um, no doubt it could be uh, age-related. It could be related to a, to a previous injury. Um, and so what, we, what we're really looking for with food effects are correlated, uh, correlations in this robustness, if you like. If we see a couple of animals in a group, as you can in this particular uh, photograph, you see 
skinny animals at the top, robust in the middle, a pregnant female at the bottom. There is individual variation. So we have to look for, for again, for, for correlated effects. Um, the, this is the uh, little drone that we use for getting aerial images. Uh, we did, uh, that's what it looks like uh, in the air above the whales. So it's, it's small and quiet and, and doesn't seem to disturb the whales in any way that we can measure. And we did find, uh, in, we did this work in 2014 and again in 2015. Um, I'll talk more about that in a second. But there was a lot of variation. Certainly, um, there's an extremely uh, emaciated animal here on the uh, left hand side, A37, and a, and a robust. Um, a very robust individual on the other side. Um, it was, it's, it's, one can, can me take these measurements with, with a high degree of precision, and here's a real porker. Um, <laughs> so so um, the um, plan, what we've done so far is focused in 2014 on northern residents in, uh, in Johnson Strait in the month of August. We got um, 80 individuals, <coughs> roughly, I think it was one or two, um, good photogrammetry grammatry images. Um, 2015, we went back and did, did it again and got about the same number of individuals photo, uh, photographed. We then went down in September of this year um, and focused on southern residents, and we got all, all of them in the population on the very last day. It was a huge amount of help from the whale watching community down there, by the way, putting us on to the whales. We wouldn't have had a hope otherwise. Um, Next year, we're going to spend, so the objective from now on is to, we, we've got some funding from National Fish and Wildlife Foundation, it's awesome, and so in 2016 and 17, we'll be doing uh, southern residents early season and late season, so we can look at change over, over the course of a season, and we don't, and we'll, we'll be doing southern, northern residents once a season again uh, to look at, at annual change up in Johnson Strait, and we'll do big killer whales opportunistically when, when we get a chance. Um, we're, uh, we're allowed to do that under our, under our permit. Um, I'll just finish by saying that uh, John Ford and, and Sheila Thornton is here, and I had an interesting meeting this week with some salmon managers, uh, just to, a very preliminary conversation to talk about how these, this kind of, of condition monitoring of killer whales might be in, and perhaps should be, will be incorporated in, in salmon management plans as time goes by. So it's early days, but, but I have to say there's, there's really good support within the department for doing that. So uh, thank you very much. Questions? Go ahead. Uh, the, tr the question was, any idea where the transients are coming from? Uh, the ones that we, so which transients that Mm hmm Oh, I see. Sorry. Um, I should, this is my fault for using old terminology because I'm an old guy. Um, I should have called them biggest killer whales. I'm really just referring not, not to them being transient by nature, but um, that was the name that we used for, for the, the population of, of mammal-eating killer whales. Um, confusingly enough, they're fairly resonant. Um, <laughs> they move, they move uh, you know, substantial distances on a daily or weekly basis but their total range isn't terribly dissimilar from the, from the resident killer whales. Graham, uh-oh, time's up. <laughs> okay, um, yeah, that was a good question. Graham asked what, uh, if I could talk about the, the uh, issue of permitting around, uh, around drones, and it's, uh, it's, I, I, thanks for asking that, because now I can talk about it, and Graham, and I would have had the rubber chicken if I'd tried to squeeze it in the talk. Uh, <laughs> yeah, we, we have, uh, to do this work, we have permits both in the U.S. and Canada, um, two permits in each country, one for one mar a marine mammal uh, research license and a, uh, and a flight clearance for the drone for, for, for the particular work that we do. Um, we often say, um, and by this time, I promise by next year I'll actually weigh it and, and, and I'll know for sure that the paperwork is heavier than the drone. Um, it, may, it may well be. But um, I think it's, um, it's a good, uh, I don't like being a poster child for the use of drones, I have to say, for, for in wildlife studies, it's not a role I'm comfortable with. Um, for us, this is a really useful tool. Um, 
it's hard for us to imagine how we could do it without getting over the whales. Um, we've, uh, uh, under the terms of our permit, we've had to look really closely at what the potential impacts of the drone is, and so far we're encouraged by our particular drone, the height we're flying, and the way we're flying it. But we have no information really about the potential impact of drones of, uh, uh, used in other ways, I guess. Um, and uh, so, I'm, obviously, I use the technique. I'm optimistic about it. I think it's a it's a it's a good technique. But I really uh, am pleased, I guess, that they that there's a fair bit of scrutiny going into into permitting. Um, and uh, uh, if if other people are contemplating using them, by all means, I'm happy to talk with you and uh, and about drawbacks and permitting and other issues as well as the science. Talk to Lance more about that and maybe also wish him a happy birthday, I understand. <laughs> a big one. Um, so our last talk of the morning is, uh, are you going to both be presenting or? Oh, you're just going to present. Okay, so uh, it's a, it's, he's going to talk twice as loud, he says. Uh, so George Taylor is going to uh, present a film uh, with uh, that was shot by Catherine. Yep. Uh, if you want to give a brief intro. Sure, I'll get, just give it a quick 20 seconds. Uh, I'm sort of a non-academic marine mammal enthusiast, and I've, over the past couple of years coming here, I noticed that uh, as the day goes on and your stomach gets lighter, your attention tends to drift a little bit and you get tired, and every time a video comes on, people perk up that little bit. So I thought that before lunch, I'd share a quick bit of footage that my wife has shot primarily over the last couple of years uh, down here and up uh, around Telegraph Cove.
We're going to break for lunch. Um, a reminder that with your name tags, you can go over to the Beatty Museum. Uh, just let them know at the front desk before you go down. It's a chance to see the whale. Uh, other reminders, if you want to buy pizza, to, uh, yeah, you can get that at the registration table. And finally, if you're presenting after lunch, see us before you eat so we can get your talks loaded. Be back here in an hour and 15, I think it is. <laughs>